Okay, so welcome to the third uh, in a series of model tips. Um, I apologise that this is a slow start. Um, unfortunately, the way I want to plan these out, obviously the little uh, uninterested, uninteresting bits do have to come in somewhere. Uh, so this uh, video is going to be all about your hobby area and equipment. Um, and I want to mention uh, 10 what I think are essential items. I also want to do 10 honourable mentions. Uh, now the honourable mentions are items that you can live without or you may not use every single build but nevertheless are very important tools. So starting with an airbrush. Now, an airbrush is very very useful um, it just helps you with your painting there's a few techniques you can use that you can't use with a brush but at the end of the day you can live without an airbrush my second item which I don't think I'm going to be able to show you because I don't know if the lead will reach and that is an air compressor which you will need if you have an airbrush um, by the nature of an airbrush the air comes through you need something to put the air through and thirdly something that I cannot show you because I don't have it to hand and that's a respirator now this can come in the form of a proper proper respirator um, or you can just use a face mask um, now when you airbrush it's going to throw particles up in the air now the paint is non-toxic um, however if you breathe in those particles they're obviously going to build up and you could end up with various uh, uh, problems so the fourth item is a screwdriver now when you're building things sometimes you need to screw screws in um, but the reason I, I've only done it as an honourable mention is because you're not going to use a screwdriver for every every model uh, so next up we have a hammer um, this is a small hobby hammer extremely useful for just for knocking bits in and you'll see that it has a brass end on one end and it has acrylic end on the other um, it does come this this particular hammer does come with interchangeable heads um, very handy just for knocking things in just very very gently don't ch -ch -ch with it um, so it is a very useful tool um, the next item is a photo etch bender um, now sometimes scale models have photo etch now this is a photo etch bender um, it's not the only one in there in the world and basically the way you use it is you just lift this little bit up you pop your photo etch in and then with a razor blade or something similar focus you just bend it the reason I've only done it as an honorable mention is because you can just as easily bend photo etch with a couple of pairs of pliers or something similar just a photo etch bender makes the job a lot easier uh, the next item I have on the list and guess what I don't have any clamps now clamps come in a variety of uh, formats uh, so I thought I just saw one um, here we go I knew I had a clamp so so this is a clamp this is one of many many different types you'll see I've modified mine a little bit I've just put a bit of foam on the end um, now these are very handy for example if you glued a wing two wing parts together you can clamp it down the reason I've made it an honorable mention is because I feel that in many many cases let me show you this masking tape does a pretty good job and I tend to use masking tape I favor that over clamps any day of the year um, obviously there's times when clamps are better than the masking tape um, but again you're not going to use them every single build uh, so the next thing we have is styrene sheet now as you are probably aware all model aircraft are made out of polystyrene expanded polystyrene um, and sometimes it's useful to buy things like this styrene sheet this is exactly the same material as um, let's get this one this is a thinner one and this is a really thick piece for some reason there we go and I've got some nice thin pieces as well so little bits of polystyrene uh, polystyrene sheet same material as the models 
you can use it for filling large gaps you can use it for modifications uh, you can just make things out of it I've made little small boxes before out, out of it and um, again it's not something you're going to use and I would suspect most people would put that down as an advanced modeler's tool uh, the next thing I have is dropper bottles I decant a lot of um, not paint but liquids I decant a lot into these little bottles with a little uh, syringe this is this is blunt this isn't a needle um, but it's a needle like end and then I can I can then use this and I just find that's a lot easier to use than these big bottles you get a lot more control but again you can live without them um, and then lastly we have and I don't have any an on hand alcohol um, alcohol and by alcohol I don't mean have a pint while you while you're working uh, alcohol is a very useful tool cleaning uh, making airbrush uh, uh, paint thinners making paint cl uh, airbrush cleaners etc etc very useful stuff however let's get on with the what I feel is a 10 pieces of essential equipment for modeling Okay, so what I've done here is I will show you my desk a little bit later. Um, I've gone onto the internet and I've looked for some pictures of uh, hobby desks. I just want to show you some different setups that I've found and why I think they're particularly good or useful for a certain job. So this is the first desk setup that I found. And as you can see, it's a very small area. Um, so things have had to be organized very well. Uh, now I can see that this guy is obviously a figure painter. Um, but you can see he's got his paints on the left he's got a nice little light source um, he's got his brushes he's got a little paint uh, a, a little pot so he's got a model that he's working on and I, that looks like a speaker in the corner uh, so I guess he likes to have music on while he works um, so yeah that's a nice it's not a huge setup but it's obviously works for him um, so the next one we've got we see this is a much more professional setup um, obviously this guy this could be a commission painter um, so this is a large setup comfortable chair um, everything within arm's reach um, it's a good little setup there um, so this one is another small area um, and again he's a figure painter by the looks of things um, obviously just received a package for something on the, on the right there so he's got all of his brushes he's got all of his paints he's got uh, two light sources there uh, so that could be useful um, I know that with figure painting um, light source is extremely important so quite often one of the tricks that you use is you hold the figure up to the light in a certain way um, just to see how the light hits it uh, so the next one is uh, this one this is again this looks like a spare room converted um, there are other things in there like I see he's got CD rack there um, but it's a nice little setup. He's again, he's got everything within arm's reach, uh, and I think that's the most important thing: is you've got a nice clear area to work in, and you've got everything within arm's reach. And I believe I've got one more. Now I've got two more to do. So this one again, there's an awful lot going on here, um, and you see he's in the middle of working on something. Um, so he's obviously a Games Workshop fan there. Um, but again he's got everything within arm's reach and then lastly we've got this one I might even have another picture I have got another one so again this looks like commission painters uh, basement to me um, he's got quite a lot of stuff and again you notice that everything kind of goes around in a C shape so he's got everything to hand now this one I found quite interesting um, this one comes across to me as uh, maybe a husband and wife uh, where they're both perhaps doing hobby time so we've got we've got painting area there we've got a few little drawers um, we've got a sewing machine there we've got printers 
um, I don't know if those horses are painted um, but you see this this would make a very good shared space so if you're sharing your space with somebody else who does a completely different hobby this would work just as well so let's scare the living daylights out of you all and we will look at my hobby desk um, so this is as it looks from my camera um, and again I have a clear space uh, which is the main thing now what you can't see on my space is that I've got drawers all laid around the outside um, and then I have things that I'm working on all laid out in the side let me just see if I can I can't really do that so um, yeah so we've got um, yes yeah, so a hobby space I think is the most important the next most important thing is you can see on here I've got a cutting mat and now sometimes what I will do is in addition to this cutting mat if I can just get it I will then get a smaller cutting mat generally I mean this is enough to do uh, a hobby on but I like to use a cutting mat especially if I'm painting as you can see there I've got I've got paint all over the place um, if I wasn't using that that paint would now be on this cutting mat and I use this cutting mat for filming non painting projects as well as painting so obviously I don't want paint all over the cutting mat if I'm doing a, a non paint project um, so cutting mat and the main reason we use a cutting mat is obviously when we cut things it's not going to go through and cut the dining the, you know your family the, uh, antique dining table so next up a very important tool is sprue cutters now essentially what sprue cutters are and let me just adjust my lighting a bit right so sprue cutters are useful for getting pieces off a sprue these are also called side cutters and uh, now these ones are made by micro nippers um, yes I would recommend them um, but I'm not going to at the moment this isn't a recommendation video uh, now you'll notice that they have they slant inwards I can't get a focus on this sometimes my light is just too strong to get a good focus right so there we go they slant on the inside and they're flat you see how they're completely flat on this side and the reason for that is that when you cut something and all of a sudden I've got no sprues or anything to hand to cut with so I'm going to cut a piece of paper and I think that will actually demonstrate quite well so if you need to cut along this uh, a line there let's draw a little line on so you need to cut this line and this is the piece that you are going to, to need this is the piece that you want to cut off if you come in this way you've hidden most of the piece so you see there that it's hidden so what you always do is you this piece that is, is, is slanting inwards that always faces away from the part that you want to cut and then what you do is you can come into the part and then you can get a very precise cut I'm really sorry about this focus guys there we go so we can come into that and then we can snip and then we always turn the part you see there I've got my clippers in the wrong way so I come round this way and then I will just bring bring the clippers into the line I'm so sorry about the focus and then we can get a fairly precise snip or not in this case there we go so we've cut that very precisely and then once we've cut that piece off uh, we then move on to uh, filing now we have various methods that we can file I use these emery boards a lot you can buy these in just about every supermarket these are the ones intended for doing your nails um, and I do like to use these and then what you will do you see there I've got what I call a little sprue nub it's a little piece that I've cut a little bit too long so what I can do is I can come in and file this and then I'll use these to file it down so that it's almost there 
and then I will switch to some high grit sandpaper as you see I've got 2000 there uh, 1500 and 1000 and basically with sandpaper the higher the number the smoother it is this is um, like rough paper um, whereas this is like sand glued to a stick this is probably about 100 200 grit so it's very very rough and then uh, what you do is that you can go increasingly more fine this is quite rough uh, fairly rough this is quite rough and this is almost smooth um, so that again lots of different sandpapers you can also get um, so I'm just trying to find everything quickly um, I have some needle files which all of a sudden I had them already and now I cannot find them so bear with me one sec Okay, so the third kind of file that I, I own are these needle files. And these come in a variety of shapes and sizes. This one is flat. Now these are very rough. And these can actually file metal as well. And uh, the way these work are exactly the same as, uh, as anything else, any other file. Um, you just literally... Just like that. Um, this one is square, so this is very good for getting into corners. Um, I can't find anything with corners. So there we go. If we want to file into there, we can get in there, and that will do two sides at once. Uh, this is triangular, so this can do at angles. Uh, again, it can also get into corners, but it won't do the two sides at once. But you see how I'm just gently moving that, twisting it. And this one is a round one so between these uh, you can file down now I often use these as well this is another this is a nail buffer this is for primarily for doing nails so there we have a very very coarse side we can then flip it over and we've got a smoother side so this is more for grinding this is more for shaping and then this bit is it's not even sandpaper it's uh, it's kind of like a leather type and what that will do is uh, that will buff things to a shine so this could be used maybe not this side but this could be used perhaps for canopies where you've perhaps got a scratch you can then sand the scratch out personally I would use these more for for canopies really fine grit sandpaper and then just finish it off with this side and that will just polish it up you see how that's come out shiny um, I haven't filed my nail down but there you go look quite dull and now shiny so that's how that works so next up that I have which I feel is extremely important you will use just about every every build are tweezers now tweezers are used for um, picking up small parts uh, applying decals etc etc 
um, and as you see I've just got a small selection of my tweezers I just these are things that I just pick up as I go let me just get rid of that chopping board cutting mat um, so we have a straight pair of tweezers there this is just really good for picking up small bits um, you can pick up just about anything um, these angled tweezers these are a little bit more useful for that to know what that's, that's useless and that one um, try and get some that are springy um, so I find this one is more useful for when you want to place parts and I don't have anything small to hand right there we go so let's so whereas this these are more useful just for picking things up if you want to actually place something because you've got that angle you can actually come into the part and then apply it exactly where you want it um, and that's quite useful um, we've also got um, people will use different ply uh, different tweezers for different jobs and there will be a fair argument to say that so I'm just trying to find them um, so I bought this set of four tweezers recently and I can never because they're new I can't remember which ones are which so there we go so these ones have got a non pointy end and these are a little bit more useful for decals because obviously if you go in with a you see how they're pointy they're really sharp bats you could stab yourself with those quite easily if you're not careful now if you're going to apply really thin pieces of paper with that you're going to run the risk of actually uh, piercing them and ruining your decals so with something like decals use perhaps a blunter pair um, none of these are angled but these are mainly different lengths um, if you do find yourself with a pair of tweezers like um, where's that useless one there you go these are quite use useless because you see how there's no spring um, that's easily rectified get yourself a screwdriver or something and just pop it in there as much as it will go and then you can just bend the backs and then seem to have bent them so they're permanently in on themselves now that's almost like it's glued itself in how strange is that yes yeah, so you can just add a bend to that and you see how they're, they're now a bit less useless We've just bent the backs bit so e easily fixed so the next item on my list uh, and that's a cutting knife uh, now again these come in many many different geysers um, I have a big Stanley knife somewhere there we go um, and I tend to use this for cutting to be honest with you I tend to use this for cutting bags open um, it's too big to do anything precise um, you can buy uh, what they call an exacto knife um, now i think exacto knife is a name brand so i'll call this an exacto knife style um, so if you've seen any modeling videos this is the kind of knife that you'll be used to seeing um, and what it has you twist this off and then you can change the blade and it's very easy to do uh, my knife of choice is uh, I actually discovered this um, Citadel uh, Games Workshop used to do a brown knife um, and it was exactly the same as this and it's weighted in such a way that if I had this blade obviously it's a retractable blade so that's always a lot safer so look right now I can't cut myself because the blade is in but if I do have the blade out if I was to drop that because of the weight of it it's more likely to land like that on this nice rounded point a uh, nice rounded end than it is to land that way um, and on two occasions I have dropped this and it's landed on my foot and touch wood both times it's landed that way obviously you don't want to deliberately drop it into your foot now the actual blade you see that I've got three settings on this blade 
this is open in the cutting position I can then extend it further and this particular knife takes a uh, 10A blade which is exactly the same blade um, that surgeons use for surgery and it's a it's a disposable blade so once it's uh, once it's um, dull I can remove that blade and I can put a brand new one in and uh, most people will recommend that you you change the blade when you start a new project um, if it's a particularly large project you could change the blade part way through um, but one to two blades per project is, is the norm and a brand new blade for brand new project okay so the next item um, is glue now there are essentially two two well I'm gonna say two types of glue um, so we have polystyrene cement uh, polystyrene cement comes in many many different forms ignore this that's not really a poly well it is a polystyrene cement so I'll include this <coughs> so this is the polystyrene cement that we all know as kids it comes in a tube and it, you push you squeeze the end and it comes out the end now the way that cement works is you have two pieces of plastic and it actually melts with, on contact so this end will become melted and this one and then as you bring them together it's it's like um, you're, you're actually making the two pieces of plastic form and melt and then come in as one so it actually it kind of joins if you imagine this is the microscopic um, if you look at the plastic on a microscopic level this is what the plastic looks like and without the glue it's just going to do this once you glue it it all melts and then it does that and that's kind of how it's stuck so that isn't coming apart um, I'll come back to this in a sec because um, we also have super glue so the way super glue works is that it grips to one piece and one and then it holds them together um, so the pieces are still straight and they can be split apart I know I had some super glue I, I did a reorganizing of my desk this morning and now um, things have gone all over the place um, here we are right so this is an example of super glue um, and this is exactly what it says now little bit of a backstory I believe and then you can correct me if I'm wrong um, the this was invented as a uh, like a plaster um, soldiers they might get shot or they, they cut themselves and what you can do is push the two pieces of a wound together apply some super glue and that will hold that in exactly the same way that stitches would um, don't try that at home um, but I believe that's that's how it was uh, what it was invented for now super glue tends to be used for for the sake of argument non plastic parts so if you're gluing photo etch um, or anything like that that's uh, that's probably the best glue to use now coming back to the polystyrene cement this is like I say this is the one we know and love the problem I find with these tubes is that it's very easy to lose control if you squeeze that end too much you get loads of glue come out um, and it's just it's just going to make a mess so uh, Tamiya this this happens to be made by Tamiya but other companies have done the same thing um, and we have this um, extra thin cement and as you can see it's like water and then it, you apply it with a brush now I just want to do um, I want to demonstrate what I what I know as capillary action and I think the best way to do this is with two small pieces of sprue so the way that in fact we can demonstrate all of the uh, glues I think so let's get some pieces of sprue so the, 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 the old polystyrene cement or poly cement the way you apply it 
is you, you can put some down on a piece of waste plastic or something and apply with a cocktail stick but we'll do it the eight-year-old method so you see there I lost a little bit of control there um, and then we just apply a thin layer along like that and then we bring the two pieces together and then after a while you need to just leave them now to demonstrate the way that it um, eats eats the plastic um, or melts the plastic if I get a knife let me get another piece of sprue that will be easier so if I get the back of a knife you see I'm scraping that but it's not really doing anything nothing at all if I now apply a little bit of cement to the top just a little bit and then I leave it a couple of minutes I don't know if you can notice this but the cement the, the plastic is starting to get soft let me apply this this tends to be a little bit a little bit faster acting I will come on to this glue in a bit So, see unfortunately I can't demonstrate feel but using the back of a knife I can feel that that is softening the plastic and can you see that this that glue has gone grey and that's because I'm actually removing some of the plastic so it's kind of turning the top, the, the top surface of the plastic to a kind of a soup and then obviously the other end is being turned to soup and then that soup is being mixed as it comes in now you can see there I've got a little bit of a mess there that's just where I lost a little bit of control and that's one of the disadvantages to the uh, thicker glues but actually now you do need to let this cure for a while but if I just pull these apart Oh, it's stuck already oh it's too stuck too right there we go so can you see how it's stringy and that's part of the can you see how it's stringy and that's actually the plastic pulling apart now the way that this works these thin glues you, right I will demonstrate both in fact let me just so I'm making a bit of a pig's air of this I will be doing a video on glues uh, at some point and how the different uses are but in a nutshell oh I need more sprues sorry guys I've overcut the sprues and I haven't got enough left for the demo right so in a nutshell if you if you bringing the two pieces together I will use this extra thin and hopefully sometimes you can get a really good we, we apply this for what we call capillary action now what will happen is we can hold these two pieces of plastic together like so and hopefully you get a good shot and then as we apply don't know if you saw that but as you apply the glue it runs into the edges so that is now glued now I have applied way too much glue but can you see how there's there's no mess even though I've applied too much glue because it's doing it by rather than you pushing the glue in the parts are actually taking the glue off the brush so can you see just on the right in between the two pieces of sprue the gap was just a little bit too big to take glue and that's because these sprue pieces aren't I mean they're not designed to be glued together um, but yeah so that's that's how that one works now in a nutshell if you're bringing the parts together I will use the extra thin if I'm if I'm bringing the part and I'm having to attach the piece uh, 
onto a glued surface I will use just normal Tamiya cement Tamiya cement is a little bit thicker I don't know if you can see that on the brush it's, it is still runny but it's a little bit thicker and I think it's a little bit slower drying so what we would what we can do um, let me get a, this piece so if we apply the extra thin can you see that in that in that time it's taking me to focus the camera the glue has evaporated now if we take this and then we apply our glue not too much less is more just like when we put super glue on can you see the shine it's still there so that just gives us a little bit more time to bring on our part onto here hold it and then there we've glued it so in a nutshell if I'm bring if I can hold the parts together say for example two halves of a wing um, then I will use the extra thin um, if if I need to for example um, apply this piece this is a little bit harder and I can't I can't hold those together so what I will do is I will apply the glue to the target um, where possible sometimes it really depends on the situation I could put a little dab of glue on there and then I can bring this part on with my tweezers which I've mentioned earlier so that's that's um, I mean gluing is possibly one of the most important elements um, this is um, this is plastic magic this is essentially this is the same thing as Tamiya extra thin um, the way it's different is that this will actually glue ABS plastic as well as polystyrene cement whereas Tamiya ABS will only do well it, it advertises that it only does ABS um, I haven't tested this on polystyrene, uh, polystyrene because I've got these two glues and one of the things I do like about Tamiya is they have the different colour coded tops um, they do an orange version and I believe the orange version is exactly the same as the, the Tamiya cement um, but it's got more uh, citrus based um, ingredients in I think it's got something to do with allergies or this is this is a very very strong smell um, oh yeah very very strong you didn't really want to do that yourself um, so whereas the orange it doesn't have a smell um, it's it's I think it's non-toxic this is as you can see they've written poison on it um, I wouldn't and it's a fire risk flammable whereas the orange one isn't but the orange one is no better than this and it's about twice the price for about half the quantity so I'm afraid you won't see it in my modeling kit right so we've done glues and we've done the types of glue there are other types of glue uh, such as epoxy resin um, I will do videos on those as it comes up and I've just found the super glue that I was looking for um, this is this is exactly the same as the previous super glue but this is more of a gel and I find gels a lot easier to work with um, because they're thicker um, so I say there are other types of glue and I will do videos on them as and when they come up uh, epoxy resins for example um, I've got a metal glue um, this video I'm just going over things briefly um, so the next thing that I have as I see as essential kit is masking tape and if you can buy the masking tape in uh, various uh, thicknesses so much the better um, but you don't need to if you if you need a, uh, a thinner strip of masking tape you can always cut this with your with your modeling knife and there we go we now have a thin strip of masking tape so 
you know I would suggest um, I think this one in the middle is about six or eight mil and I, that's if you can only buy one roll of masking tape that's the one that I recommend um, because it's a good general purpose size this one I, I use tend I tend to use it for when I'm masking uh, larger areas like when I want to hold them down and this one is quite useful for uh, let me show you if I want to mask off a bit like say for example a canopy um, because it's smaller I can just put it in lightly and then I can just manipulate it uh, we'll get that corner in just I don't know if you can see this well but see I've got it at an angle so now I can I can manipulate and I can see that this is now too far up and then just by not pushing it right down you see there I mean that's still a little bit off but it, it's more manipulable whereas a larger piece has got it's gripping more so it's going to be harder to use um, but to be honest with you if I was doing canopies and things I'd probably cut that even thinner um, possibly looking at something like this um, so yeah that's masking tape now the great thing about masking tape is that it's it sticks very well as you can see it sticks to my desk extremely well but it's what we call low tack so it's not a permanent stick so what we can do is if we want to um, let's say we want to paint this bottle and we want the top half uh, white and the bottom half blue what we'll do is we'll paint the whole lot white and then once we come to do the blue because obviously we don't want overspray so we will mask off there we go and then I, I would also put a piece of masking tape along the top and then that's our border line between the white and the blue then we will spray over there blue and then when we come to peel this off there will be a, a straight line and you see that I haven't I haven't pulled the sticker off the uh, off the bottle there's no print come off because it's what they call low tack uh, so lastly almost lastly we have what you would probably think is the most important thing and that's paint brushes uh, paint brushes are obviously important now I tend to find that even if I have um, even if I'm using an airbrush I will still use paint brushes so this is a selection of paint brushes that I've got and what you will find is over the years well oh, that's terrible condition that one isn't it um, you will pick up a selection of paint brushes uh, this is a number two Humbrol Airfix brush and this came with a start set it's a good all round brush nothing special about it but it's not useless so that's a good one this is one of my favorite brushes this is a Rosemary & Co series 33 this is Kalinsky Sable which I'll go on about Kalinsky Sable in a little bit this is another one um, this one is I don't know what this is made of I think it's sable but this is a shade brush from Citadel so this is obviously for applying shade as you can see I've not used it for applying shade because it's got all that dust in it um, these are some cheap nasty brushes that I got with a, a case um, I bought I actually bought a brush case and it came with brushes I didn't want the brushes but the case was a good price so um, these I just use for anything that might destroy a brush or anything where the finish isn't important um, I think I used one the other day I was painting something and because I knew the paint was so thin I'd need about five coats so I just like that with a bottom coat just to get it on quicker um, this is a sable brush um, this probably isn't the best brush to show you because it's so small this is another Rosemary & Co series 98 this I think is a uh, I don't know where these came from I've had these a long time and they're cheap and nasty but they do actually work and this is another one of my ones that I got from the case so let me show you basically the different types of brushes that we get 
Um, we have got um, right there we go so we have got this is a kids painting brush and I find this extremely useful for cleaning an airbrush out um, it's it's not really any good for painting um, but it's usually made for uh, used for I use it for mechanical work and I think I picked this up from a toy shop and this is one of the kids arts and crafts brushes um, now this brush this is an eye water brush but essentially it's another kids arts and crafts brush and those bristles are nylon absolutely useless for painting it's far too hard um, but this is actually for cleaning an airbrush again and I also use this for mixing paint by the way so you put you get a dollop of paint pop it in there put your thinners and things in and it mixes it really nicely and because it's a softer brush you can scrape the paint out this is a bit better for painting because you can see I can get this is a dirty airbrush I know um, but you can really get in there and clean it out and it does a really good job cleaning so not to confuse that with um, with an actual paintbrush um, this Humbrol one I can feel that it's a nylon brush it's a nice brush um, but it's got doesn't absorb any any moisture because it's nylon um, so the paint will stick to the outside of the bristles and and it's okay it's not a bad brush um, then we have a sable brush now I believe a sable is a type of squirrel uh, rodent and these these bristles come from their tails um, but this is a very nice brush um, and it's don't know if you can see that the springiness this springs back because it's nylon whereas something like this no that's actually that's a synthetic brush um, but these tend to not spring back so either they're a lot softer and then this one which is my Kalinsky sable that comes to a point easier can you see that once it's moist can you see I get that really nice fine point and what I the reason I like these is something like this can you see that I can only really paint something that needs a number two size brush um, if you've got an area that really needs a, a size zero um, you really need a size zero brush what I tend to find with these brushes because that point is so good I can actually paint with the wrong size brush and still get a reasonable result um, but most people will say oh yeah these these are these are good but I mean if you uh, I forget what number it is um, but a Windsor and Newton do some really good brushes and um, these are exactly the same but it's Kalinsky Sable um, so that's your brushes and that brings me to the very last item which I think is absolutely critical and that's cocktail sticks you can buy these just about anywhere they're cheap and they're really really handy for applying glue is what I use them for most um, scraping paint off if you over painted on a canopy you can actually scrape the paint off because acrylic comes off by by rubbing um, I also use them for um, just about anything that you can think of really well anything within reason um, so when I was painting these wheels um, what I did was I clipped the end off and then I push the cocktail stick into the hole there and now I've got a handy holder for doing my my wheels um, really really handy so um, that is that is my um, that's my top 10 items that you need for a hobby desk plus an awful lot of waffle for which I apologize um, again I hope that helped you out um, so we have covered planning and buying of the kit we've we've used the internet to research our kit to make sure it's a good kit for us 
uh, this is uh, obviously this is our hobby area and equipment um, so now we're going to start seeing kits and we're going to start doing things with the kits um, so what I'm going to be doing next week is I'm going to be preparing the kit maybe slightly slow um, because we're not we're still not going to do anything with the kit um, other than make it ready to actually start work on so hopefully um, I'll catch you next week and you guys have a wonderful week